like left unchecked, YouTube will be just as negative as the mainstream media. And the reason is because all the same forces apply. Like the people that sign up for newspaper subscriptions are the same people that watch videos and click on ads. So if a piece of content that says ChatGPT is terrible for society, if that does really well and converts a bunch of newspaper subscribers, it probably will also do well on YouTube and convert a bunch of people to some brand sponsorship. John, welcome to the podcast. Really grateful and honored for you being here. Really admire your work and I'm excited to dive into your story here today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So good to, good to be yeah, here. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to start with your header for, I believe your LinkedIn, which is Founders at Work by Jessica Livingston is the book you're reading. Is there any particular <laughs> um, significance to that being your header? Um, yeah, I, I, I think so in the sense that um, back in college, I bounced around a lot and I feel like I really, really dodged a bullet by landing in kind of the YC community. Um, and what I mean like by that is that um, I went to kind of a weird college, Northeastern University in Boston. and. It's a, I, when, when I was there, it was a five-year program where you take six months off every few semesters to do a co-op, and you actually work full-time, 40 hours a week, at a company. So a company can basically treat this like intern, instead of like a summer intern, they have someone from January to July, and then from August to December, so they have full-time coverage, so they can kind of create like a real role. Um, and it gives you like a better experience of what, of what working at a company is like. The problem is, is that I just hated everywhere I worked basically. Uh, and it was just not for me whatsoever. But I worked in a really, really wide range of, of places. Like I worked for a, a really small 50 person Series B startup. That, that was actually pretty cool. I worked at a, a, a venture capital firm that was like three people. <laughs> I worked all the way for like a life insurance company that was like thousands of people. It was in like the Fortune 100. I worked for the government at one point uh, uh, in the, the Census Bureau doing stuff over there. And like, it was just a lot of different experience. I think by the time I graduated, I had like four or five different jobs that I was like kind of picking from on my resume. Um, and my, my, I studied economics and kind of the default path would have been to go to, into finance of some sort. And I just, at the last second, kind of had a career advisor who was like, you don't need a job. Like you should go and look into kind of entrepreneurship. And I'd been working, so they recommended that I work at this really small seed stage venture capital firm that had like $10 million under management, which is like nothing. Um, but there they were writing like very, very small seed checks into companies. And I met some of the founders and I could kind of tell that they were very much making it up as they went along. <laughs> And, and then I started reading PG. Paul Graham, <clears throat> read, for those read, unfamiliar. Yeah, reading Paul Graham, reading Hacker News and getting into the kind of understanding what was going on in Y Combinator. And so um, after college, I went out to Silicon Valley. I moved in with another team that was doing YC. We were doing a similar, uh, we, we were doing a program that eventually got merged into YC, but it was the same structure. So it was three months, you show up, they give you a little bit of money, you have to build something and then demo it to investors on, on demo day. Um, and as soon as I got there, it was like, okay, this is like what I was meant to do. And, uh, and so, yeah, I've just always had like very deep respect for founders. Um, but I think that, I don't know, I think that like, it takes a while to kind of understand like what entrepreneurship is in a sense. Like, like, I don't know, maybe I just didn't like, I didn't really internalize it when I was a kid mm. that like these things come from like everything you use comes from some place or somewhere. Like I remember when Facebook got built, I, I just thought it was like a website. And I thought it was I thought it was the equivalent of like a website that I would build, you know? It's just like a little more complicated. You don't think of it as like, oh, there's like a thousand people working every day, you know, in this big organization when you're a kid. Um, but but Paul Graham and the Y Combinator community kind of like unlocks a piece of understanding like like 
before you see you know, some huge entrepreneur on the news, there's this path that gets followed. And, and that was just fascinating to me. So yeah, that, that, that was just kind of, yeah, deep respect for the YC team forever. What about Paul Graham's essays <clears throat> hit you so deeply? Hmm. I think, I don't, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but I can kind of describe the opposite, which is what a lot of people were putting out into the world. It's kind of like that, that like, that like Ted talky vibe. That's like very, very polished and very much, um, just, oh, just sit back. The future is coming. Like, the flying cars will be here any minute. Don't worry. Like, you don't have to work at it. Like, the future is cool. We're going to solve all these things, these problems. But, like, they're just going to get done. It's very abstract. And and there's nothing. And, and, P, and Paul Graham's, like, much more methodical with the idea that, like, like being a founder is extremely hard work. There's a very, there's a, there's a whole host of skills that need to come together. I love this quote where he says that, you know, building a startup usually requires like four or five completely different skill sets to come together. Like you need to, you might need to know programming and then sales and then also some interesting financial engineering thing and then some interesting, you know, marketing or branding trick. And you need to bring all of those together to make the thing actually work. And ideally you find that in just two co-founders or like two or three co-founders um, and and no one had really broken it down like that before um, and and that really and I, I think he was like the first he was the first person because before Paul Graham I'd read I'd read a little bit of Tim Ferriss and I liked the four-hour work week but it was very much focused on like the lifestyle business side of entrepreneurship. Very, very individual, very just kind of like, oh, go build a business, but like you're basically gonna do it alone with like your virtual assistant who's gonna be in like the Philippines. Um, and Paul Graham was actually talking about like how big companies get built. And that was very, very interesting because I feel like the, um, a lot of people focus on the economic outcomes from different businesses. They, they might say like, oh, look, you, like you could go and try and start the next Google, but there's a 99% chance that you fail and you'll wind up like without that much money. It's much better just to start a lifestyle business where you can make like a million dollars a year. Like that's way better. But I think that, I don't know, I think that the economic impact and the scale of the companies is actually a pretty good proxy for like the impact that that company is having on the world. And so, I, there's this joke or there's this question on Twitter that people ask a lot where it's like, would you rather have 100% ownership of a $10 million business or a 1% ownership of a billion dollar business, like assuming you founded them? And it's supposed to be like, don't give up dilution, like be, be you know, in charge, like it's good to have complete control. And like, I don't know, I think it might be better to start the thing that's worth a billion dollars and has a big impact and then bring a lot of people along on that ride, create a bunch of jobs, have a bunch of co-founders, like maybe 1% dilutions way too much, but you know, I, I don't see that as a, as a failure in the, in the same way that a lot of other people do. You always felt that way. As soon as you came upon Tim Ferriss, you were immediately like, all right, this is not, this is cool, but this is not for me. And you came upon Paul Graham and the idea of entrepreneurship and you're like, all right, I want to dream big. Cause if I remember me thinking about both of those scenarios at that age, yeah. it was like, dude, I just want the easy path. Give me the easy path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what, what was it for from your perspective? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I think I kind of understood that I, yeah, I, I, I wanted to be involved in, in something, in something bigger. And I liked, I liked a lot of the, like, like the Tim Ferriss books are great in terms of, in terms of just like that early development of, 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 you know, the, kind of like the hustle that's required to like get something off the ground. Like th th there is a lot of value there, but, um, but it doesn't talk enough about scaling in my opinion. Uh, it, and, and, and that's where, that's where Paul Graham, I think was really, really key in talking about kind of laying the foundations for, for, you know, massive, massive growth. And, and a big part of that is working with venture capitalists. Um, I remember, I remember hearing Ken Griffin, the founder of Citadel, talk about like his his story, and he was talking about how, well, you know, he started this firm and it was going pretty well, 
And then he was talking to, to Mark Andreessen. And he was saying, like, well, like, yeah, as you know, Mark, like, if you don't, if you don't uh, scale your capital, like, you're not going to get very far. And he just said it, like, so matter-of-factly. But it really is true. Like, like the, the, the number of companies that have, like, an outsized impact on the world that don't figure out how to effectively work with the financial markets is – very, very low. It's very, very low. I think there's something where it's like, you know, 99% of, 99% of venture capital startups fail, but 99% of the, of the market cap of the public markets is of companies that took venture capital, something like that. Those might not be the exact numbers, but it really, it really shows you that like every big company that we know of, like they all, they all figured out how to work with the capital markets because it just accelerates everything. What, might not what might people not realize about venture capital and about YC? Yeah, I mean, I, I think <clears throat> like it's important to understand the the history of like why Paul Graham's blog was kind of revolutionary it was because it was from this founder perspective and it was kind of pulling back the 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 curtain on this world that had been very predatory. There are tons of examples of, of venture capitalists coming in and taking like 80% of the company for $1 million. Uh, and even, even just a few years ago, I remember talking to entrepreneurs who'd say, oh yeah, um, a, an investor came to me and said, I love what you're doing. Um, I'd love to put in a million dollars to help you get the business off the ground. How about we make it even, let's go 50-50. And it's like 50% dilution in the first round is kind of unheard of in Silicon Valley. We, we normally deal with like more like 20%, 10%, 30%, something like that. So um, just, just, just kind of laying a foundation for working with venture capitalists effectively so that you don't get taken advantage of was, was very revolutionary. And then, I mean, I like to think of YC in some ways as like it's like a union for entrepreneurs where there's – where there's such a huge network effect and there's so many different companies all in this YC network that if a venture capitalist screws over one company, they can get a bad reputation and be excluded from the entire startup community. You spent some time in YC and I'm curious, what were the biggest learnings or lessons that surprised you and the stories that go along with it? Because I, if I'm not mistaken, you, you started in the 2013. 2012, and yeah. 2012. So you must have seen some incredible companies get built Coinbase. and seen the founders. Yeah. yeah so what was, was that like in the early days? Uh, I mean, it was remarkable. I mean, with Coinbase, I mean, that was a wild journey. I, I, I wasn't super close with them or anything, but um, you could just kind of see that they there were these huge waves in crypto and like massive winters. And I, I talked to Brian at one, at one party and yeah, he was saying like, it is a marathon. And, and I think at that point, like it was maybe post post 2017 crash or something, prices were down and stuff, but he was just continuing to build. And then like the latest bull run and it just went to the moon. And like, it's, it's just wild. Um, th that, that was a very interesting company. And then OpenSea was in my other batch in, in 2018. So like two of the biggest crypto companies like of all time were like, you know, I'm, I'm like sitting right there basically. Uh, it was re remarkable. Um, but yeah, I mean, th there were also uh, like Zapier. Do you know that company? That was also in my mm -hmm. in, in the same batch as Coinbase, and like a wildly different path where they barely raised any money and got really, really big and you know, fully remote and just a very, very different different culture there. Um, I think, um, I mean, the, the the most basic takeaway from YC is just that you see a uh, you know an incredible amount of competition. So you're in this environment. You see everyone's you know they're they're showing up every week who has the most traction and momentum is very clear. So that's just a very, uh, it's just a competitive environment. Like if you're the type of person that like to play competitive sports and would thrive in those environments, like if you, if you can run faster in a race than just around the track, like you're gonna do really well. Um, and I think that's probably true for entrepreneurship broadly, like competitive edge and, and, and competitors tend to do well. Um, but I mean, in terms of like the actual lessons, I mean, PG does put out a lot of stuff on his blog. <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, but I remember he did come because I was in, in this other incubator that was like affiliated loosely and he came and gave a talk and it was just like very just like inspiring to just be in the same room with a small group and kind of like 
hear somebody say like, yeah, like, like, like I have watched this pattern play out again and again and again, and it can be done. You just have to like work hard. It was just like a pump up speech basically. And it was like extremely valuable. <laughs> I don't know that there was any like, you know, crazy unlock, like, oh, this one weird trick that you can do to just immediately make money. It's like, no, it's a lot of hard work, but uh, sometimes all you need is like competition and encouragement. Who were some of the most important competitors for you during that time? Um, I mean, it's, it's like not, it's not like specific companies or anything like that. It's like, it's like, oh, like, like this guy showed up and had built something cool. So I went back and built another cool thing and like, you know, like gotcha. spent extra time learning Python or getting better at <laughs> iOS development or something like that. It was like, it was like, it, it was motivating to go and like, like, like advance. Most of that time in 2012, because I studied economics in college, most of that time was really just the best way to learn programming because in any other environment, either, like if I, if I'd gone and tried to get a job at Google, they would have been like, you can't code. So you're a sales guy or something. And I would have been like, oh, well, I, now I can't learn to code. Or like there just was not, there wasn't really a clear path, but by going into, you know, entrepreneurship, it was like, oh, anything that you need to do, like you just have to learn how to do it and then just go do it. So it, it was very freeing from a perspective of like, I had, I wanted to go deep into computer science and, and learn programming. And like the YC environment, like definitely created the space for that where I could be, I was terrible when I joined and I was pretty good by the time I, by the time I finished because I was just like shipping code every single day, like building projects constantly. Super cool. What are the similarities between scuba diving, computer graphics and gaming? That's a good question. There aren't that many. I could try and come up with some crazy bank shot thing, but I think they're just three, three things that I kind of fell in love with early and have continued to work on. Like with scuba diving, I had a cousin who was a marine biologist who was, in, you know, researching manatees and, and I just thought it was super cool. Um, I'd, I'd always wanted to be an astronaut, obviously, who doesn't, but I found out that the astronauts train for zero G and scuba diving. So it's like, hey, you can kind of get the, the astronaut vibe from scuba diving. And then I just really like scuba diving. It's just a very peaceful, you're weightless, you're just floating there. It's very meditative. It's just a great, it's just a great sport. Um, it's safe. It's like, once you know how to do everything, it's very safe. Like you're not gonna come away with like an injury, like, oh, I tore my hamstring or I ran into a tree. Like it's, it, it's once you know how to do everything, it's very simple. Uh, it's great on vacations, beautiful locations. You know, it's very easy. Um, uh, and then computer graphics, kind of similar. Like, I mean, computer graphics probably came out of the, the video gaming. I mean, video gaming is just like, okay, I was a kid, I played video games. Who didn't? Um, and then that, and then that evolved into like, okay, now we're going to mod the game. We're going to change the game. We're going to build our own levels. We're going to, you know, develop our own stuff and tweak things. And uh, and then took a course on computer graphics, and then. Uh, really, really got into computer graphics with my second company because I wanted to create marketing collateral very, very quickly. This was a long time ago before we had artificial intelligence that could just generate you an image of exactly what you wanted. So you either had to take a photo of it or you had to render it. And so when you're an early stage startup and you don't have product made, iterating on the photography is really, really critical. And so computer graphics, allows you to kind of create a mock-up, light it, render it, get a photo or an animation, and then put that out on the internet and, and see if people want it. So it just kind of like, it was just a way to short circuit the feedback loop essentially of, of testing and iterating. Something that like, I mean, you see it all the time now if you go on Instagram, like there's plenty of ads that are clearly 3D rendered um, and it's pretty commoditized, but I actually love the, the, uh, the, the like, like the, the experience of building something in 3D. It's a really, really cool, uh, just a fun experience. It's very much like coding. You can write software to automate a lot of it. There's there, there's pieces of software in there. The more you know about software, the easier it'll be to pick up. But then there's there's this other side of artistry and actually making something look good. And that's something that like, it's really, really hard. That was the hardest thing for me to learn was like the lighting, understanding what looks good understanding the principles of cinematography. Um, but 
because I hadn't even really used a camera that much. And in 3D, you have to use a virtual camera. So, um, so most of the 3D artists, they come from creative fields. They come from um, like photography or videography, and then they eventually learn uh, 3D software. I kind of came at it from the other direction of like a software engineer learning it, but but it was really fun because it's a lot faster. Like the reason I can understand where to put these lights to make myself look like this is because in 3D you can just move them around instantly and they don't mm -hmm. cost anything. <laughs> if you want a really, really big light, you can just scale it up instead of having to pay for a bigger light. <laughs> yeah, this is something that I notice in everything that you do, it always looks good. Whether that's like the marketing campaigns for Lucy or your YouTube channel or just even your background right now for those watching, it looks spectacular and it looks like it can draw you in yeah and that's such a competitive advantage in today's day and age because everybody is trying to capture attention and the things that look good are the things that our eyes will go to so design is such a critical skill in yeah. the modern day world what advice do you have for people who aren't that good at design to get better at it i mean i was terrible at it i know I, I i was like the worst at art in in high school like couldn't get the pottery wheel working and like I, I, everything was a disaster with me. Um, I relate. But, but then, I mean, eventually I just, I just got, I, I, I think it's like you, you need to find like that, that hook to like get motivated to, to start creating. And for me, it was like this really weird Reddit that I found called like high effort memes. I think it was called like high effort memes or high effort gifts. And it was basically like, like they would take, they would take like movie clips and then they would go into After Effects and like track text into the clip and do all these really crazy edits on like the movie clip, all to make like a very dumb joke about like the Reddit itself. It was all self-referential. But I got into that and was really interested in like, oh cool, you can like manipulate video with After Effects and started, so I would just like, oh, we went on a vacation. I'd make like a little travel vlog just for like me and my family. and. Um, and just finding little creative outlets where you can go and learn and that are very low, low risk. Um, that was really important. And then just kind of like getting in the flow of like consuming the, 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 the content around that, that will help you learn the new skills. So like I watched a ton of cinematography videos. I watched a ton of uh, just like critiques, like lighting critiques for film and television and um, learned all about the, the history of computer graphics and, and all, all, all the different uh, all the different technologies that could kind of make something look better. And then you just have to practice. Like it just takes a long time. Even now, like I, I see like there's a lot that this could be much better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure once you know the, yeah. the secrets, it makes you think like, oh, I can improve it these ways. Other than design, what are some of the other core skills that people might look over when they look at your career and what you've done and say, ah, they, they might not realize that you were actually good at this thing and that thing is part of the reason why you succeeded. I think the, I think, I mean, the, the, the unique blend that I bring to YouTube that I, I think is like my unfair advantage that allows, that, that creates like defensibility is that I, I studied economics, I can program and I'm a Silicon Valley founder. Um, and I've actually raised money from like real venture capital firms and built like venture back startups. So that <clears throat> that unique blend is 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 very very rare. Um, it's it's not that it's better than anything else. It's just like it's a unique weird surface area that that there aren't that many people that are in that specific niche. So w what that allows me to do is. Like, yeah, I could write software. I don't write a ton of software, but I can at least understand how software gets written and I can critique software projects, which are, you know, the things that we're talking about every single day now, that every tech product is like in the mainstream news. Um, but I can also understand the economics behind it and understand the business. And then I can also t speak to like the founder side uh, and read between the lines. I think that's the most important thing is just reading between the lines because a lot of, uh, a lot of the tech press is written from a journalist perspective, and those folks don't have experience actually interfacing with venture capitalists or entrepreneur or, or engaging in entrepreneurship themselves. So they tend not to understand what's actually going on when when the founder says, 
yeah, you know, how are things going? And they say, oh, it's going great or something. You know, <laughs> like I, I've been there and I kind of can, I can read between the lines and I can know exactly what's going on or, oh, so somebody got screwed here. Or somebody, you know, somebody's upset with somebody or, or there's a reason why we haven't heard from this person or whatever, you know, can kind of understand it. Yeah. Why does the media in general paint technology as a bad thing? That is an extremely deep question. It's an extremely deep question. I think there are a lot of reasons. We could talk about this for hours. But, I mean, the most vanilla explanation is that it, there's a pendulum that swings back and forth. And in 2008, 2009, 2010, tech was like this cool, fresh thing. You know, we got the iPhone. We just got so many delightful things that, that the, pre the, the tech press was just adoring. There were just... Oh, time and time again, a new, oh, this founder's going to change the world. And then you had the TED Talk circuit where people were saying, oh, we're going to cure world hunger with this. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And it was just over and over and over again. And, 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 you know, we just started with like, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. And then of course, things kind of took longer. We didn't get the self-driving car yet. Like all these different timelines missed. And so that kind of shifted. But I think that you could go a lot deeper too and just talk about technological stagnation and how tech hasn't been delivering in the world of in the world of atoms. It's only been delivering in software. Like we haven't really been seeing any any progress in the physical world in innovation. Like if you look around, things kind of look like the 1970s, except for like the screens. Um, hmm. Everything else hasn't really hasn't really advanced that much. Like the you know. Peter Thiel likes to talk about the, uh, like we're not moving faster, we're actually getting slower. We used to be able to take the Concorde supersonic from New York to London in three hours. And now the average speed of the airplanes are in America has gone down to like 550 miles an hour, it's getting slower, and then you add in TSA and we're moving even slower. So, you know, all these different, all these different things like obviously like energy and there's just so many different areas where tech has kind of under delivered. And, and then there's a lot of questions about, okay, why is that? Is it regulation? Is it some fundamental physics property? Is it just capital formation or, you know, inspiration? Like, are, are we just not encouraging the geniuses to build the right thing or are we limiting them somehow? Um, it's, 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 it's very unclear, but um, I mean, I think that that's, that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of the, the the story of the of the tech press. I think that, I mean, there's also the factor that like they're under a lot of pressure to make money because obviously they're losing ad revenue. So um, there's questions about maybe negative content does better. Why is that? Are people depressed? <laughs> We can turn this into a psychology podcast if you want. Uh, like you, you, you can peel back this onion for like hours and hours. Like it, it, there's no, there's no end to where we, to where we wind up. And yet, despite all of that, you describe yourself as a tech optimist. Yes. At least in your Twitter bio. Yes. So, and I would consider myself the same as well. But why do you consider yourself a techno optimist? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think. Just fundamentally, historically, technology has been a net good. Um, every technology has had some negative to it. Obviously, like you look at cruise ship technology, well, the Titanic happened, you know? Um, but then also people got to enjoy cruises and they got to move around the world faster. And same thing with planes and, you know, really any technology, you know, social media, like it's very in vogue to say like, oh, social media is destroying people's brains and it's so bad. But like, I still think it's probably a net good. It's probably, you know, adding to a lot of people's lives in terms of entertainment and education and connection and, and helping people stay connected to each other. Like it's still probably doing a lot of good. Um, um, although that's like controversial to say now, um, but in general, like we, it, it feels like we've, we've, we've been very good at, at developing technologies and, and, and kind of finding the, the right, the right implementation of them that, that does have a positive effect on society over the long term. Um, I think I think the bigger question is like I I definitely believe that that there's a lot more to unlock. Um, it's just like I'm not entirely like devil may care, just go out and build everything. But I definitely think that there's a lot of of good that can come from it. I refuse to believe in like the you know like there's nothing more to do in tech, like we're done theory because 
like nuclear power is just so obvious to me. <laughs> like it's safe, it's it's abundant. Like we can just make a ton of energy very very efficiently, and it would be clean and amazing. And so the fact that the fact that that we haven't gone and done nuclear at scale yet is a huge reason for techno optimism in my opinion and really really uh it really drives home the idea that that there's something that that we're not at the physical limits of what's possible there is an argument that might say you know time travel might never be possible or faster than light speed travel might never be possible um but like we know that we can get to the moon so like we should be able to go to the moon whenever we want. We know that we can get to Mars. Like we put a helicopter on that just recently. Like, so we should be able to go there regularly. That, like, like the reason that we aren't doing these things is not some fundamental physics science problem in my opinion. It's, it's, it's either a coordination problem or a regulation problem or an economic problem. I, re I recently posted a poll asking, what do you think will come first Artificial general intelligence, like computers as smart as humans, or a man on Mars. And it was exactly 50-50. <laughs> it was bizarre. But I think that kind of makes sense because the AGI feels so much harder than going to Mars. Like we can, we could shoot someone to Mars right now. We could just yeet someone to Mars and they would be there and they'd be screwed. But all you need is one person who's crazy enough to be like, yeah, I'll go live on Mars for the rest of my life. And you could do it essentially. Like it's not that difficult. We can clearly land a human safely on Mars. But there's no economic incentive for that. And there's no, there's no industry that's going to build around that. But like when you think about the forces to create AGI, it's like Microsoft's investing billions and billions of dollars in this stuff. Like, like there's such a huge infrastructure of people that want to benefit from AI. So, so there's just there's all these different interesting, interesting problems that that we have to work through. But fundamentally, I think it's it, it's pretty clear that that there's just so much opportunity for technology to increase, you know, prosperity. Why is Microsoft investing ten billion dollars in ChatGPT? I mean, it's very clear that it's will just improve all of their products. Like, you use the you use ChatGPT for five seconds, and you're like, "This is a great writing partner. This should be Im embedded in Word." And then you look at some of the stuff that it can do. GPT three. I've seen implementations in Google Sheets and Excel where it can autofill things. It's just clearly like it's it's hugely complementary with their Office suite. Drafting emails. I mean, we already have some autocomplete in Gmail. It guesses the next few words. Like, why not just populate the whole thing, right? So that seems extremely logical for them. And I, I think it makes a ton of sense that they would do that. Makes sense. Um, I'd love to talk to you about YouTube in general, why yeah. you've spent so much time there and particularly devoting yourself to creating videos at the highest level, it seems like. What went into the decision to start putting yourself out on YouTube? I mean, the simple answer is just like, it was the pandemic, I was bored and I had free time for the first time in a decade. Um, I'd been an entrepreneur for 10 years basically and you're normally really busy, you don't have time for like side projects. But then the pandemic came and I didn't have anything to do on the weekend because there were literally no, no events. So decided to turn on the camera and just kind of talk. And I figured that I didn't know exactly what would come of it, but I, I had a feeling that if I just let it snowball for a couple of years, it would get big and it would be valuable in one way or another. And at the very least, I'd be able to meet other people. And that was that, that happened almost instantly. Like you put something out on, on, like you put an analysis of a topic out on YouTube, someone is searching for that, and then they email you, hey, I wanna talk about this topic because you're the only person that's talking about this. So um, so that, that happened very, very quickly, like the serendipity machine kind of idea. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I think in the long term, like there will be some sort of business model. It clearly is, is good at attracting young entrepreneurs, attracting the next generation of technologists. Um, so there's, there's probably some way to like monetize it at some point. Um, I've already made investments in startups that have met me through the YouTube channel, which is cool. That's kind of a proof point for the, for the project. Um, but then also, I mean, to get to your point of like the negative tech press, um, this is something people don't understand is that they, they see a negative, a negative thing about tech in the mainstream media and they think that, oh, independent media on YouTube will solve this automatically, but that's not the case at all. Like left unchecked, YouTube will be just as negative as 
the mainstream media. And the reason is because all the same forces apply. Like the people that sign up for newspaper subscriptions are the same people that watch videos and click on ads. So if, if, a, piece of con if a piece of negative tech content, uh, if a piece of content that says ChatGPT is terrible for society, if that does really well and converts a bunch of newspaper subscribers, it probably will also do well on YouTube and convert a bunch of people to some brand sponsorship. So that force is, is constant. It doesn't matter that one, it, the mainstream media is like a large corporation and the, and the YouTuber is like a small individual creator with like some single member LLC. That doesn't matter. Like what matters is the economic incentives and they're both, they're both incentivized the same. So I kind of saw that YouTube was very, very negative and I wanted to kind of pull things back in the other direction, ideally. So a lot of my content is, is, is framed almost in the negative to attract those type of people who might be clicking on negative content. But then once they get deeper into the video, they find out that I'm actually making an, a, an optimistic argument about the technology and then maybe I convince them and maybe I, maybe I change their opinion. Um, but, it, but it takes a lot of work. And, and I don't really know if there's, like the benefit from that, like, improve, like increasing techno optimism in the world, what is the, what is the return from that? How do you measure that? It's very difficult. But I mean, in general, if like, if I can, if I can wind up, you know, making someone more techno optimistic and then they go and build something really cool, then I wind up with that really cool thing. I, I, I often think about like, you know, like, like Jeff Bezos and I like probably have the same phone. Like we probably, our favorite movie, like his favorite movie, I've probably seen, right? Cause like he doesn't have access to like different things than me. He has access to like the private plane and I don't, but like, but like for a lot of our experiences, they're, they're actually very similar. And so encouraging people to create cool stuff, oftentimes the cool stuff that they create gets very, very evenly distributed throughout the world. I think it's such a, what you're doing is so important because how we view technology is ultimately our, the future that we'll create. Yeah. And if we think technology is going to destroy us and it's the end of all times, there are going to be a lot less people creating stuff yeah. and building stuff. Whereas if in India, their, their, their media is saying technology is a force for good, they're going to end up in a much higher position, relatively speaking, than we are in the United States in 50 years because they just had a different belief in their head about what was possible. So that's why I bring up, you know, the opinions and perspectives of media on technology because I think it might be the most important thing for United States prosperity, but honestly, global prosperity over a long enough time horizon. Yeah, 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 I completely agree. It's, yeah, I mean, it's just like, it's the only option <laughs> is to kind of build your way out of, uh, out of a problem. Um, yeah, what's odd is that you often see with the, with the techno-pessimistic crowd is that they'll simultaneously make the argument that like technology is bad and we shouldn't work to develop new technologies, but also the status quo is not that good. <laughs> they'll often say like, like, things are bad right now. It would be very different if someone was saying like, no, actually things are perfect, I have no complaints, the government's amazing, everything's perfect, society's great, we don't need anything new. But I've never heard anyone make that argument. They always say, like everything sucks and also the future sucks. <laughs> it's like, okay, I don't, know what to, I don't know what to tell you. Like you want nothing. Yeah. The, the problem is you. And the, yeah, I mean, a lot of these people are just like depressed and nihilistic. Like there's just nothing you can do. The belief in the potential for a greater future is everything. I, I was listening yeah. to Sam Altman talk about how optimism is the most important trait and that he, he tries to spend as much time as possible with, with optimists. And yeah. that's an obvious thing when you talk to a fellow optimist, but it's not that obvious when, you're, when most of the world is pessimistic. Well, did, have you done anything in your own life to help you be more optimistic? I've thought about this a lot, and I've thought that, I mean, I, I think it's, pr it's probably a very complex set of factors that go into like creating an optimistic mindset, right? It's like can't be suffering from like food scarcity, you have to be healthy, there's a lot of different, like, like we could just go through like the basic, like, tr like, you know, like have a family, work out, eat healthy, don't use drugs, like don't have, don't indulge in vices too much. Like we could just do a podcast on like the, you know, living a good lifestyle and that would probably lead to like an optimistic 
out outcome. But I think that you can in some ways just like tell yourself like I am an optimist, like let me really focus on the on finding optimistic solutions at every possible time and just train yourself to 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 think about things that way. And almost just see it as a game. Yeah. So like any any, any problem that you're per like like I mean co comedians kind of do this where like you can throw if you're hanging out with a comedian like you could throw like any news story at them and they'll be constantly thinking like how can I think of a funny riff on this? And they're doing that like kind of naturally, but also kind of because it's their job, right? And and they and they get paid when they come up with something funny. And if you think about yourself in technology, you could kind of do the same thing where you could where you could say like Okay, I'm just going to try and find the most optimistic take on anything. It, it's funny because I, I feel like there are a lot of people in tech who, who they're, they're I, like, maybe I'm not just a tech optimist, but maybe I'm like just an optimist generally. But I find that like a lot of people right now are, they, they, they complain about a lot of things. <laughs> and and I, I really try not to. Like, um, like people would people would complain about like oh the white lotus or like uh, like glass glass onion wasn't that good or like the new avatar movie wasn't that good like I saw all those they were fine they were good I I liked them it was fine like I I try and like I, I try and like have a good experience and I don't know like I just like I I'm sure if I if my job was to find flaws with Avatar I could find them and I could tell you how it's not that good blah 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 but like. No, like I, I personally want to have a good experience in life, so I, I feel like I kind of try and look on the bright side, I guess is like the cliche, right? <laughs> and and just, just forcing myself to do that results in a really, really great outcome. Like it's a really great lifestyle. Like I just actually enjoy life. <laughs> you, it's so funny that you say it like that because you've also said before that you like being uncomfortable. And this is a quote from you. Sure. I've kind of rewired my brain to only be satisfied if I'm uncomfortable or failing or making something bad. As soon as I start making something really good, I think, okay, I need to be less comfortable. So there's an interesting paradox there between wanting to feel uncomfortable and also looking at the bright side of the future. Well, I mean, I, I, I think there's actually more of a similarity there, which is like, which is like being uncomfortable and then looking on the bright side. Right. So like like constantly feeding that that cycle through where where you 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 do something awkward that you know is bad but you're already excited about the slope of the curve or what's future what's possible in the future, right? So like True. like I spent like a year getting like 100 views a video, but like every week was awesome because I was like, oh, this is cool. Like it's it's like 10 more views than last time. Like yes. you know. And and so like uh, yeah, the, 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 the uncomfortableness is not, it's not a sadness and it's not a pessimism. It, it is definitely a, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the joy of being at the bottom of the exponential curve. Mm. And knowing that today is day one, right? And you're yeah. like uncomfortable with what is. Exactly. Exactly. And, and knowing, and knowing objectively that you're like, like there are a lot of there are a lot of people that are on like linear linear trajectories, and and so and so you'll see as you're on this exponential trajectory that they're they're gaining ground on you and they're doing better, but if you actually understand that you're on a you're on an exponential trajectory, you you can you can really really relish the fact that although what you're doing currently is objectively worse, like you are lower on the on the on the y-axis, but your growth rate is compounding faster. And so you will, you will surpass them. What have you done to help you think more exponentially when it's so not intuitive? I mean, I think I literally took a bunch of statistics classes where I like fit curves to exponentials and then it just became like kind of, like all the way back to like calculus in high school was useful in terms of just teaching me that this is like a normal phenomenon and it's just something that, it's just a, it's a, it's a mode of thinking that you should just apply to things. Um, mm. I'm not like some mathematical genius or anything, um, but I've just like, I've taken statistics classes, I've taken math classes and now that's just one of the tools in the tool chest that I pull out whenever I'm thinking about something. Um, and then it's also just a mega meme now. Like everyone thinks like, oh, we got to think in exponentials, whether they're like a VC or they're talking about COVID or they're talking about anything. Like there's, there, it's just like people kind of have internalized that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just like 
learn how to learn how to fit a curve properly, I guess, is like, it's just a valuable skill regardless, especially, um, especially as, as we start to reason more about like, uh, you know, multi-dimensional problems, things that can be only solved by AIs, things that can only be solved by, you know, like, you know, trillion parameter models that have a, a trillion different directions that they can correlate off of. Um, using that kind of like, like mindset is going to really, really be benefit people. What are you most excited about in the upcoming five years in terms of technology? Um, I mean, there's a lot of things. Um, I mean, last year, I think I was, last year and, and the year before, like when I started the, the, the channel, I was really focused on artificial intelligence, space exploration, and uh, and then I was a little bit interested in crypto, but more from a political perspective, I would say. Um, it's it's such like a noisy space, but I do think that there's something there's something important there long term. Um, and and now like the space has kind of uh, the, the the space exploration theme has kind of broadened into um, space exploration theme has broadened into aerospace and defense technology. That's been a really interesting place to, to research since, um, you know, obviously tensions are escalating globally. We've seen crazy stuff happen with, there's a ground war in Europe going on with Russia and Ukraine. So obviously defense technology is going to become really, really important uh, over the next few years. And then on the artificial intelligence side, things have kind of narrowed there where, where in previous years we were talking about so, uh, like you know, flying drones and self-driving cars, and then there was I, I did early video on GPT three and some of the stuff that was going on there. Um, but now it's like it's like generative AI specifically is the trend. Um, but but I think that there's probably a lot more to it than just that. Like the like the text generation and image generation is very very cool, and that's going to continue to 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 grow. And this year is going to be amazing. But um, but there there obviously is more going on in artificial intelligence than just those two like niches. Um, and then yeah, I, that, that's that's a lot of what's kind of kicking around in my head. There's a little bit of stuff on like the bio side, but I don't but I don't have as much experience there. How could we prepare for a future that we don't know how it exists. Like I was just talking to Brian Johnson yeah. and, and he was talking about like, we couldn't possibly know what a good human looks like in 2050 because we have so little knowledge of the ways in which we're going to change. And I don't know if I necessarily agree or disagree with that perspective, but it made me think like, is the future that we're headed towards so unlike the one we are currently living through today that we can't even possibly begin to practice or try to practice the ways in which a good human would operate in that time. What's your perspective on that? I don't know. I mean, I, I, there's certainly uncertainty about how the future will play out. A lot of good sci-fi out there about it. Um, obviously there's optimistic and pessimistic takes. Um, doesn't seem like anyone's really like acting on these yet. Like, they're, like we're, we're not seeing like the Dune, Butlerian Jihad where people are trying to like kill AI researchers because they're so afraid yet. Um, but then we also, we don't see, we, we don't see, the, we, we don't really see the opposite where people are kind of just like, well, I'm not gonna work at all because what's the point? AGI is right around the corner. It's gonna be abundant and I won't need to work. Um, which is kind of like the, the 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 super optimistic perspective, which is just oh, there's just abundance and and you don't have to do anything. Uh, so no one's really like no one's really internalizing those, even though they're talking about them a lot. Um, on kind of like the the one notch down from that, you know, it's like um, yeah, independent thinking becomes very very important because obviously artificial intelligence is very very good at at interpolation and and. ChatGPT often spits out kind of like the the average opinion of about anything, and it's very very good at that. Um, so that's that that's going to be you know like actually thinking independently is going to be very 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 critical. How do we get better at that? I mean, I think it's like some combination of of training yourself to not overconsume on a me media diet, like not, not overeating, 
essentially when it comes to your media diet um, so that you're actually forced to think things through from your, your own first principles or your own beliefs. And then um, probably just a lot of practice of seeing, like really, really holding yourself ac to account for when you were wrong. I think a lot of people don't do that. They just kind of shift from one thing to the next and they don't really notice that, okay, the, <laughs> like I was really, I was really buying this line hook, line and sinker. And then it panned out completely different. I mean, that literally happened with like the pandemic where like in February, the mainstream media was like, it's a joke. Don't worry about it. It's the cold. And then for the next two years, they were like, it's the worst thing ever. Like, how could you ever have doubted this? And it's like, you know, <laughs> so, so like, you know, I, I actually, actually like, like keeping a scorecard for yourself probably so it seems important. Do you ever, do you have any best practices you can recommend on limiting your own media consumption or limiting your own technology consumption? Um, I mean, I, I, I don't think like there's like screen time things like works that well. I, I, I think the bigger thing is just like actually finding like, like, interesting stuff that's better like yes if you don't if you don't have any interesting books on your shelf like you probably will scroll TikTok all day but if you have a really interesting book then you're just going to pick that up um so so actually being deliberate about like curating some high quality content for yourself like thoughtfully and making space for that is is important um yeah i have this theory that like 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 millions of people are becoming like illiterate, not because they can't actually read, but be, if you define literacy as like being able to read a book on paper within the scope of one year, like 10% like of our population can do that now. <laughs> you know? Like people just can't yeah. do it. They just can't do it. It's just impossible with like, they have too many distractions, too much going on, busy, like it just doesn't happen. But it is, it, it is very, very important. It's really, really hard. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, essentially, there just seems to be like v uh, big returns to like the longer the form of content, the better the, the 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 feeling. So, yeah, like like actually sitting and reading a book that takes you like twenty hours to finish, like it's probably way better than twenty hours of mindlessly scrolling TikTok. Yeah, I think most people would agree with that. Yeah. Well, what has been the last thing you've changed your mind on recently? Hmm. Last thing I changed my mind on. Or, or something you've changed your mind on? It doesn't have to be the last thing in particular. It's a good question. I might need a minute. While you think, I'll, I'll yeah. tell you mine is about NFTs and was totally overwhelmed by the media of Twitter of the day. Really got fully immersed. This is the future. This is what's going to change everything. Yeah. And, and kind of didn't have a bigger picture of like, well, yes, maybe, but like maybe over a longer time span, I just went fully in it and believed it fully. And then kind of looking back on it, I'm like, wow, that was kind of naive of myself. So, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, crypto is an easy one because I like, yeah, they're like the, <laughs> the, the, the whole narrative flipped several times. Um, that is a great interview question, but it's just really, really hard to actually think of something. I guess, I, 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 guess, I mean, I guess related to AI, like, like I think that now it is an appropriate time to start discussing AGI timelines. Whereas mm. in the past, that's been purely the providence of sci-fi. So pretty useless to talk about <laughs> in anything but the most abstract contexts. And, and now it feels like we, we actually have a, some sight lines and probably need to have more conversations about that. I kind of wish the Lex Friedman podcast was going in reverse right now because he used to be the artificial intelligence podcast. And that was like I the remember. main focus of his channel, of his content. And now he does a lot of different stuff, but we need, we need someone like that to just facilitate long form conversations purely with AI researchers about just about AI and the future of AI. I think that would be very, 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 very valuable content right now. Um, and, and like salons, I'm not talking about like, you know, the mainstream media debating it on like Fox News and MSNBC. Like, I, I don't think that's going to be productive. I actually think like if we can stay away from that, <laughs> it'll probably be better. Um, but I mean, th th these things are already happening. Um, pe people are already talking about this stuff much more significantly. Yeah. 
are there any particular researchers or people you think would be effective to talk to, uh, particularly around this subject? Because it's one that I'm fascinated by, but I don't know too much about it. I don't know yeah. the people to talk to even. Yeah, I mean, th there's a good, there's some good diagrams on Twitter for like that map all of the different AI folks based on are they optimistic or pessimistic? And do they think AGI will happen soon or later? Sooner or later. That's cool. And so it's like Sam Altman is in like AGI pretty soon, but also pretty optimistic. Um, there's this guy, Gwern, who's this anonymous researcher. He's extremely pessimistic and thinks AGI is going to happen like very, very soon. Then there's other people who think AGI is going to happen, you know, it'll take decades, but it'll be bad when it happens. And there's other people who think, oh, it'll be good, but it'll take a long time. Um, I, I can send you the, the, the link to that. It'll, it's pretty interesting if I can find it. Yeah, I definitely will check that out. Going back into your yeah. YouTube and your, your goals for 2023, uh, how has your YouTube channel helped Lucy at all, your company? Yeah, I mean, mostly it's helped with, with hiring. It's just a great, you know, obviously you're putting content out to a lot of people. It's very easy to, to pull from that audience to hire people if you need to hire someone. Um, and then I think on a bigger scale, it's just helped with storytelling. And, mm. you know, in pretty much any business interaction, you're tr it helps to be able to think through the story that you're telling. You know, if you're, if you're trying to sell something, you're telling a story like, you know, you're selling Nikes, like you're telling a story about someone who was not good at running and then they buy this product and then they're transformed and then they, and then they become a good runner and they become healthy. Um, like plot is what happens in a, like a movie. It's like, the, it's like the action steps. Story is the transformation of a character. So, so who will be transformed? So everything from like, you know, you're, you're pitching an investor how will their career be transformed by investing in your company? Well, they'll see financial returns, they'll become popular, they'll be, they'll be recognized as a luminary, as a genius for investing in your product. How are you going to execute the, the, the business plan? Well, there's a story there how, you know, we're an underdog now, but we will be transformed into an industry titan and a, and a hugely successful company. Who are we up against? Who are the villains of the story? In our case, it's Big Tobacco. It's a very easy villain. It's a great, great villain. Almost too good <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you, you get the idea. In any, in any context, being able to, to think about storytelling is, is, I think, always useful. How do you get better at storytelling other than just creating a lot of videos? I mean, you can study stories. I, I don't think you can just sit on the couch, watch 25 movies, and then make a great movie. <laughs> There's you got to practice ma making the stories, but uh, yeah, I mean it's probably it's probably like spend eighty or eighty percent of your time like creating and trying to do the thing. This is for like learning any new skill, and then ten percent of the time like consuming great works in that medium, and then t ten, the other ten percent like analysis of how it works. So like, let's say you're learning to code, probably spend. 80% of your time coding, 10% of your time like reading great code, like looking at like Python, the Linux kernel, like these great projects, like how do they get built? And then the other 10% like watching tutorials, like learning, like testing out things, like reading books on the subject, you know, looking at, you know, different examples of, you know, practically telling you how to do something. But it's always like 80% of your time is like doing the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. M checks out from my perspective. I, you would probably advise someone to do the exact same thing on podcasting, right? Yes. Like do yeah, not it's, spend a hundred hours listening to a how to podcast show or taking a course, actually go and get the reps in and then, and then sprinkle in some expertise and sprinkle in some listening to, you know, the daily and serial and Joe Rogan to see who the best podcasters in the world are. And then you can level up slowly. Well, it means so much more when you are doing the thing and yeah. then also watching the greats do the thing. Exactly. Like that's just so much more helpful yep. than just watching nonstop. Yep. I, I'm, I'm curious from, from your perspective, what is the modern day version of the cigarette? A lot of people will say it's social media if you talk oh, to a lot of people. Who, <laughs> but what, what do you think in 50 years we'll look at and the thing that we're doing today is so ridiculous or so 
socially accepted, but in 50 years it, it will not be. I mean, sadly, it's like it's still smoking. Like we have like, people still smoke a ton of cigarettes, and like the government is not banning them. Like they're banning the vapes and they're banning all sorts of stuff. But like cigarettes are marching on just fine. Like those company stocks are doing great. They're the best performing of last year. Like they're dividending out billions of dollars. Like it's a booming industry. Like big tobacco is doing great. Uh, so. Like uh, ironically, the the cigarette of today is the is the cigarette of tomorrow. Sadly, but um, I mean o other stuff. I I really I, I don't know. There's there's a lot of small things. I mean I, I I think I think the harder core stimulants are probably one of the crazier things. Like like the Adderalls and Modafinils. Like I think that I think that people are really really miscalculating the the negative effects of, of the heavy use. There's just so many people that are on this stuff daily. And I just have a huge problem with it. Like, I'm not, I'm not a doctor, like don't take, this is not medical advice, but like you go to a, you go to a psychiatrist and say like, one of the, one of the, one, one of the, one of the characteristics of having a ch child ADD is losing things. Like, show me a kid that doesn't lose something. You got like a serial killer on your hands. Like, I lost a sweatshirt every day I went to camp. I would take a sweatshirt because it was cold in the morning. It would get hot. I'd take off the sweatshirt. I'd run around. I'd lose things. Like, did I have some sort of crippling ADD that needed like hardcore medication to solve? Like, no. Like, that's ridiculous. But, like, yeah, I bet if you took a bunch of ADD meds, like, I probably would have remembered my sweatshirt, but I would have been like destroyed like half my brain, right? And so now people are like going way too deep into this stuff like there's definitely like a responsible way to use it but like the default prescription is just take it every single day and that's just insane like even if you go back to like world war ii and they were giving like soldiers like amphetamines like they weren't just saying like take the amphetamines every single day they were saying like take the amphetamines before you go charge into the enemy's like foxhole and like do the final battle right <laughs> and, and yet and yet like the shrink will just say like oh yeah take like this take this add meds every single day like even on sunday on Sunday when you can just be chilling on the couch, like watching a show or something, like even on vacation. And they're like, yeah, take it every day. Like you have this disease, like you need this thing. It's ridiculous. So I think, I think like people are, are starting to push it too far. We're seeing a lot of, a lot of like, like, uh, you know, psychosis that's induced from these medications where like people are like straight up ending up in mental hospitals and like losing it because they're pushing it too far. And I, I, I'm, I'm very, very worried. I, I, th I think we might see something like, you know, what happened with like the, like the Sacklers and the opioid epidemic. Like, I, I just, it's starting to feel like there's going to be like a bombshell journalistic, like investigative journalism piece, and then, a, and then a court case, and then a Netflix documentary, and then like we're gonna realize that it was like, oh, like they, they were like, you know, really screwing up like millions of people. Um, so that'd probably be my answer. How has becoming a parent changed your perspective on life? It's a good question. I mean, I think it's crystallized a few things. I mean, it's it's just cool to see like how much you can love a baby. Like that's kind of hilarious because like before you have a kid, you don't really just love babies. And then after you do, you just like have this amazing love for this baby and it's just hilarious. Um, and yeah, I mean, it does all the default things that you hear like, oh, you, you know about priorities and you realize that like going out drinking isn't important and like what's really important is your family and like that's all true. Um, but like I was kind of expecting that so I had kind of like priced that in essentially. <laughs> like I kind of like, I kind of knew that, oh, like, like I'm going to really enjoy this. Like I've talked to enough people, I understand that this is how this works. Um, so that wasn't like a shock or anything. Um, I think it, I think it definitely, it definitely makes it clearer that like you're like, as a dad, like I'm a man, like I'm responsible for things. Mm -hmm. Like, like I can't, like I have a lot of responsibilities that I take very seriously, and um, yeah, you know, it's good. It's important. It's like it's a good. It's definitely good for um, just overall like life satisfaction and happiness. Like I was listening to something about like the like uh, like like men who commit suicide are often uh, highly likely to cite that they that they don't feel needed or they don't feel like they don't mm -hmm. feel like they have a purpose 
And I'm like, God damn, I feel like I have 12 purposes. Like, I feel like I have, I feel like I have so many things that I have to do. Like, like I have tons of responsibilities. Like, um, and like, it's stressful in some ways, but really it's like a good type of stress where it's like, okay, like every minute of every day, I'm feeling like productive. I'm feeling like I'm doing good for the world and for my family. And I, I'm very motivated. Like it's very, it's very good in that sense. Um, but yeah, to take it back to Paul Graham, he just, he just, did you see his tweet about this? He, this is a little no. contemporaneous, but he was just he was just pointing out that like, you know, people often say that having kids isn't a drag on productivity because it helps like clarify what's important and you wind up focusing on like the most important things in your life. And he was like, but that can't be true because if that was true, then people would be having kids just for the productivity boost. Ooh. It's like, okay, that's kind of a good, that's kind of a kind of a good, a good argument, but um, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't really matter in my mind. It's like, it's like, I'm going to have kids. That's like an important part of my life. Like that's, I'm not just some robot, like automaton, like I need to maximize the amount of paper clips I make or whatever. Like I'm, I'm, I'm on the journey of life more than anything. So um, yes, like if, if I wind up making 10% less money because I had a kid, like that's a great trade. Like <laughs> I also live in California. It's the same thing where it's like I could make I could pay way more way less in taxes if I didn't live here. But I like California, so I pay the taxes. It's like yeah. Maybe maybe parenting is like a tax on your productivity, but it's like it's the greatest trade ever. So it doesn't matter. That's a clip for sure. I, I that's great. I love that rant on parenting. Yeah. I, I'm curious I'm curious how you're doing on your twenty twenty three goals. You said your three goals, make more in-depth YouTube videos about important tech companies, continue to dig into geopolitics and American defense technology, and three, learn about venture capital from the best in the business. I assume this is all professional related goals, yeah. not like life related, but how are you doing on those three? I'm doing okay. It's a little bit early to tell for a few reasons. Mm -hmm. So basically to give the listeners some perspective, uh, Starting in January 2nd, I joined Founders Fund, the venture capital firm in San Francisco as an entrepreneur in residence. So, um, so my role there is I'm continuing to make YouTube videos, but I'm talking about a lot of things that are interesting to the firm. Um, it was a great, it was a great partnership because I was already doing that and they were excited to support. And it's just been a really, really awesome uh, partnership. I'm, I'm super, super happy about it. Um, so I'm gonna be, I was already making a ton of videos about founders fund companies. I'm gonna make a lot more companies that I'm interested in. They're zero, they're not twisting my arm to talk about companies that I'm not interested in. It's just go off and, and we'll, we'll give you resources and let you talk to folks internally. Um, now on the actual, uh, so of those three things, like I do feel like the quality is increasing. I just hired a new editor. Um, and, and he's getting up to speed. So the content is getting better, but it's slow because he's new and I'm training him, but I can see the trajectory again, uncomfortable. I can tell that he's making the mistakes that he's making are not bad aesthetically. They're bad for the YouTube algorithm, which is the hardest thing because I have to be like, dude, I love what you did. This is amazing. Like this is cinematic. This would do really well on Netflix, but like we're on YouTube. So that three second intro needs to be half a second. Retention. Yeah, retention, retention, retention. 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 and it, it's just brutal. And it's like, look, I, I, I prefer your version, but like we got to do it the, the, the cheap way. <laughs> and so, so finding a balance there is, is definitely a progress. Um, and then, and then you yeah, learning about geopolitics and, and defense technology. Um, that's definitely happening, but I mean, Geopolitics is a massive, massive, uh, you know, massive thing. It's all just in service of me becoming like the World War II dad. Like that's clearly like where this is all going. <laughs> I can kind of tell. Um, but uh, but but it's been fun. I'm, I'm definitely getting sharper on 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 China, Taiwan, and and the U.S. and like the semiconductor industry. Um, just reading a lot, talking to a lot of people, and trying to understand. Um, uh, just the shape of the of the American defense technology industry and how that will evolve. There's a lot of it's becoming very trendy and very hot, um, and it'll be interesting to see how that kind of evolves over the next over the next couple of months. But um, still pretty early there, starting to starting to get into it. I've done deep dives on Google's role with the military, China, uh, Apple's supply chain in China, 
these are videos that will come out in a, in a, in a few weeks. Um, and then talking about Microsoft's invo involvement with the military. So I'm kind of setting the stage of like understanding like, you know, who are the key players? What has been done in the past? Looking at some of the history of DARPA and the history of these big defense primes and kind of understanding the structure of the industry and then going deeper into the actual startups. Um, so still very early there. And then on the third one, also very early because venture capital has been very slow recently. So there isn't that much to learn right now because there aren't many deals happening. So, um, but it's great talking to everyone at the firm and like getting to know how they think about things and just going through like what, what their, you know, what their experience has been like over the last few years. Um, that's been, that's been beneficial, but not many, not many moments of like, okay, there's something critical happening and I'm there a fly on the wall learning. That's kind of the goal. Um, but it hasn't really happened yet because there aren't that many exciting things happening in the world of venture capital yet. So it's still, yeah, well, it's early. We are definitely on the, on the early side of the, of the, uh, exponential curve for all three of those. Well, I'm so excited to track the progress throughout 2023 and beyond, and I'm so grateful for you joining me here today. I like to end these podcasts with a challenge or asking the guests for a challenge because a challenge points to the place in your heart you think people should take this conversation and actually do some action in their real life. Is there anything comes to mind for a challenge to leave people with as they go up about and do the next thing in their day? I mean, how big is the challenge? Like we could talk about like, hey, record a five minute video of yourself and post it online. Like probably be a really good experience for most people to do. <laughs> for for some people, that's a massive challenge. For some people, yeah. that's not big enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. Um, maybe maybe a good thing would be just to, just to answer that question I like the I I got really hung up on the question of like what have you changed your mind about most recently? And I don't think it's because like I haven't changed my mind recently. I think it's because like I'm kind of constantly changing my mind. Um mm -hmm. and, and and it happens more frequently than I think, so I don't really track it. Like um, um but I think I think going back and and creating a little bit of a scorecard for yourself. And I mean, that, that question is going to be something that I kind of think about maybe for the rest of the day. I don't know if I'll have a good answer ever, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think everyone should, all the listeners should try and think, think back to not necessarily something that they changed their mind on, but something that they like, where they, where they believed a narrative that they, and they, and, and they, they, they fell into a trap. Hmm. That's more, that that's important. more of it. It's more, because it's one thing to change your mind when, when, when you're just like, like, oh, I didn't know that much. And then I learned a little bit more. And then I, you know, understood the topic. Like, you know, I didn't change my mind on exponential curves when I took calculus. Like I just right. developed that for the first time. But, um, but I think that, I think that um, going back through like the news and kind of understanding the, 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 the history and kind of understanding when, when you fell into a specific pattern of thinking and revising that, that, that might be, that might be a useful experience. Well, I think Twitter is an incredible resource. If you're a public tweeter yeah. to, to look at and review, because you can look at a tweet and see what mind state you were in yeah. when you were sending certain things. Yeah. So I recommend going back. If you are a tweeter, if you're not a tweeter, Check your journal entries and your text messages. Those are good ways to find your own frames of thinking so you can put yourself back in that mind state. And I'm really grateful you said that, that it's going to stay with you, that question, because my aim for these podcasts is to help somebody learn something new about themselves. And if you can take that question and hopefully think about it for the rest of the day, you might learn something new about yourself, which will help you in some way. And people can listen and, and yeah. think about that as well. So thank you so much, John, for your time. Where should we send people to connect with you further? Uh, so I'm on YouTube at John Coogan, just my full name. And then I'm also on Twitter at John Coogan, my full name again. And uh, might, might have a podcast feed soon, but still working on that. Amazing. And please check out the YouTube channel. It is one of the most highly produced, incredible looks into technology that I've seen, probably the best YouTube technology channel in the world. Check that out, linked below, one of my favorites. And thank you so much, John, for your time. Thanks a lot.